New Thought Media Network. We are a global broadcast network of positive music, media, and entertainment. Inspiring humanity's evolution along the journey of enlightenment and creating a world of love, peace, empowerment, and prosperity for all. New Thought Media Network, positively inspiring. Hello, my friends, and thank you for joining us today for Spiritual Toolkit, where we discuss life's diversity, challenges, and blessings. My name is Brock Ford, and I am your host, and joining me on the team is producer Peter Millar, and a shout out to our New Thought Media Network founder, Robert Brzezinski. The idea for this show came from my sincere desire to be of a support and a voice for the disenfranchised, the struggling, and hurting people within my reach and to offer spiritual and ethical practices that help others transform their lives, relationships, and careers. My belief is that together, we can build a bridge of understanding, healing, and equality for all, no exceptions. And to that point, we will have guests from all walks of life discussing real life and navigating its twists and turns. And you're invited to join us each week and to participate on the chat if you have any questions or comments. So. Let's get started. I'm very excited today to have my dear friend, Karsten Spencer, as my guest. I met Karsten many years ago at Unity of San Francisco, and now we actually work together as ministers. Karsten is a spiritual mentor, an inspirational speaker, teacher, and energy worker. He is the spiritual, and I just had something pop up on my computer, it looks like it's from the twilight zone. Not quite sure what happened there. If y'all talking in just a moment, we'll see what happened here because I just sort of lost everything. Let me see. We are seeing you, Brock. Are you? Are you okay? I think I'm. Yeah, you're, we'll see you. I think I'm back on. Let me just check. All right, but I cannot see y'all. There we go. Huh. Let me see. Wait just a second. I think I got you back. All right. So can you see me? Yes, we can. Are you ready to go? Okay. Sorry about that, y'all. Looking good. All right. Well, let me start over, y'all. We've got Carson Spencer here. He's a spiritual mentor, an inspirational speaker, teacher, and energy worker. He's the spiritual leader of Unity of Richmond East Bay, the creator of Carson Energy Alignment, and the Miracle in Three Breaths. His intention is to live from the heart, holding a space of love and acceptance that encourages connection, conscious awakening, and authentic creative self-expression. Karsten, my friend, is also an artist, an actor, performer, playwright, and director. And he says, his quote is, through my own healing journey of self-doubt and self-discovery, a process of learning to be fully present in my own body, I have embraced my path as an artist, spiritual teacher, and visionary. Karsten's goal is to live from the heart, holding a space of self-love and acceptance where we can experience connectedness, unity, and oneness with spirit, humanity, and all of life. He uses his gifts to create healing, to create a healing atmosphere that allows you to awaken to your authentic self and claim your natural state of vibrant health, prosperity, and self-expression. And author Sue Frederick, an intuitive and keynote speaker, said this about Karsten. She said, Karsten is a leader, a visionary healer and teacher, creating a new vision of what it is to live in our bodies with health, 
peace and power. His techniques move people from fear and disempowerment to knowing that they have the power, vision, and gifts to heal themselves. You can also check out Carson on his website at www.carstenspencer.com. And with that said, everyone, let's welcome Mr. Carster, Carsten Spencer to the show. Hi, Carsten. Welcome. Hi, Brock. And hi, everyone. Wow, it's so great to be here. And it's so great to hear those words coming from your mouth because uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we forget that, you know, we have a certain vision and a certain process so it's wonderful uh -huh. to be here yeah uh -huh. and, and 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 i'm i'm loving the format of the show it really it, it feels really wonderful really your the whole purpose and everything just is is uh it's very consistent with with what what we're wanting to share with the world it exactly is that's why i'm doing it and that's why i invited you and i want you to get more involved with me as we go forward so thank you thank you for being here so what i want to do is i want to go way back because i know we're both old so let's go, let's go way I'm back. I'm calling myself middle age because I'm okay. planning to live till about 130, 150. So I'm just middle aged at this point. All right. Well, I'm going to call myself that too, then. I like that. So these two middle aged men, let's go way back. Where did you grow up? What was your family life like? And let's just start back there and, and go from there. So it's interesting. I just came back a couple of weekends ago from a, a, a high school reunion. It was a all-class high school reunion because the high school I went to was open for 25 years. And so there were a whole lot of people there. But the thing that was amazing for me was going back to that old stomping ground and, you know, being with friends who my, my one friend that I really enjoyed uh, connecting with was pretty much we spent most of the time together is someone that was born uh, 30 days ahead of me. And so our moms used to stroll us around the neighborhood in our, in our strollers together. So we've been friends forever. And to be able to go back and walk around this old neighborhood. I grew up in Southern California in a community called Palos Verdes, which is a beautiful community. It's out by the beach with beautiful beaches. Uh, and yet like you know, I guess pretty much most of the world, there was an awful lot of dysfunction. Everything looked beautiful from the outside, but there was stuff going on. My parents divorced when I was uh, moving into my teen years, my preteens, the family fell apart. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of learning opportunities, which is really what I see our childhood is. It's, you know, we come in and I think our soul chooses to give us everything that's going to mm -hmm. activate our ability to move forward, grow, heal ourselves, come into balance. And, you know, I kind of feel like at 68, I'm continuing to still come into balance, still to discover myself. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, you know, I, I had an older brother and a younger sister. So I was the middle child and the second son. So it's dealing with all that stuff that comes into, you know, what you get with your, with your birth you know, your birth path, where you end up in the, in the, in, in the pecking order, shall we say. Um, when, but they yeah, divorced, did, when they divorced, did you live with your mom or your dad? Well, I was living with my mom at first, but then my mom threw me and my brother out to live with my dad, which was kind of like <laughs> jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> I'm not going to go okay. into, into the depth of it, but I will say that my sister has written a one woman show about kind of our childhood it really is about our father's funeral and as i and i was i directed her in in a number of different productions of it and as we were you know as she was performing she kept saying i think we win and i was like what do you mean we win she said i think we just had the worst childhood ever like it's not a uh, necessarily a race you want to win <laughs> That's what she thought. and of course i don't believe that i think there's a lot you know, worse or better things that happened. But there was a lot of craziness. And the gift for me is, although, you know, took me a lot of, an awful lot of my life has spent healing and, and sort of trying to reclaim some of the stuff that was torn out of me during that childhood. But ultimately, that journey is what made me who I am today and made, gave me the empathy and the desire to work with people to really, I mean, just, you know, you, you read in my bio that that's really my my goal is to create this space of peace and healing and harmony and to be able to share it with others. Mm -hmm. And I think the other gift of having a really rough childhood with two parents who in their own way were very human with a lot of human frailties uh through my journey i have really come into full forgiveness for both of them and that is so freeing mm -hmm. 
it really truly is. Yeah. You know, when you said that, I I know that I had a similar background. Uh, my parents were divorced and I grew up with my stepfather and then they divorced and then my mother had boyfriends after that. But um, were you and your sister, did, did y'all get closer during that time? Because I know that you mentioned that you were directing a play. Tell us a little bit about that and how you interact with that. Well, we, me and my sister were very, very close. And the challenge with being very, very close with one of your sib siblings and having a long lifetime is you both have a tendency to carry the same karmic patterns that you got programmed with. So although we were very close as we grew into adults, it was kind of back and forth. There were times when we didn't speak. We really knew how to push each other's buttons. Um uh, but the gift is she, she, you know, she wanted me to direct this play, and I think it's wonderful. She's a wonderful writer and a wonderful actress. So, you know, she asked me, and I stepped up and did it. And it's been, it was, it was a wonderful experience. Although I have to say, the last uh, iteration of her show, which was the the Denver Fringe Festival, I was supposed to be there for six days the whole weekend, and after the first day of rehearsals and then the first performance that night. All sorts of old karmic stuff came up. Not surprising because, you know, we were dealing with it, talking about my dad and his funeral and all the stuff that came up during that. So ultimately, for me, it was really liberating because I've gotten to the point with my own teachings. When I get triggered, especially by the people that I really care about and love, I, I don't go into the blame or to fight back. To me, I've, I've just learned that, that that reaction where you throw the karmic stuff back does not allow for healing. So when she mm -hmm. kind of flipped out on me, mm -hmm. I just kind of said, you know, I, I, I need to process this. I didn't fight back. And I actually sat in the, the, the place we were staying in. Uh, she went to the bed. Basically she, basically, she yelled a number of expletives at me and slammed the door. And I just sat down and went to spirit oh my goodness, what just happened there? And I breathed into the feelings. Every time the stories would come up about, oh, this is just her and all her stuff. It's like, no, what's the feeling? And as I allowed that feeling to move through me, I literally felt like it was ancestral healing that was happening. Mm. by me not fighting back by not making her the evil one, but by just feeling what it felt like to have all that energy after working on the play, which is a lot of the childhood stuff coming up. And then breathing into it it was it was a real liberation and i decided at three o'clock in the morning when i still couldn't fall asleep and couldn't figure out how to deal with the whole thing the next day i tuned into my to my guides and they're you know they're they're present when i ask for them that's the other thing i've learned to trust your intuition when you ask for your higher guidance listen to what comes even if you just think it's your imagination Mm -hmm. The main thing I guide people to is if it feels liberating and good and lighter, it's your higher power. It's your divine energies. If it feels heavy and like, oh, I don't want to do that and feels like a punishment or somehow having to make up for something from the past, mm -hmm. it's not your higher power. That's your old judgmental parent or whatever. But anyway, I tuned into my higher energies and they said, what do you want in this situation? Because I was still wanting to show up for my sister for the rest of the weekend and her performances. But as soon as they asked that, my clear answer was, I want to go home. I mm. want to be at home where I feel safe. And I've gotten my sister to the point where she had her first performance. She's good. So I basically called a, an Uber, went to the airport at three in the morning and came home. And it was one mm. of the most liberating things that ever happened to me because it was really like taking all the energies that you get from that family situation, you know, because our families tell us who we're supposed to be. And I think very often we spend the rest of our life owning the things that are <laughs> consistent with who we are, but clearing away the all, all the stuff that that's not really who I am. I don't have to show up for everyone just because they want me to. It's okay to put myself first. So that was really the gift. So it was wonderful. And, you know, we, we, a couple emails went back and forth, long emails. And mm -hmm. that was liberating, too, because I was able to speak my truth without blame or vindictiveness. Uh, and the separate, we, we haven't spoken since then. And, you know, she's still in my head. And, I, you know, the love is always there. But I feel okay about taking the separation and allowing us both to, to process and grow. And, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. But it was was a real it was a, a turning point in a way but also a real a real i felt like coming out of the cocoon in a way mm -hmm. 
thank you for sharing that such personal information. And I also know that um, you mentioned trauma and forgiveness earlier, and I, I don't want to take up too much time because we have a lot to talk about today. Right, but, at, but at any rate, I wanted to touch on those two things because it seems that most of the ministers I've met in the last three years uh, going to seminary and at uh, Anton and different and unity and village and things of that nature, I'm meeting people that had such trauma in their lives as early, you know, young children, teenagers, things of that nature, and not just gay people, uh, but people just straight people, trans people, whoever they are with families had trauma. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things I learned in seminary was that I had to forgive. And it was difficult because I carried that with me for like 38 years and wanted to tell that story to everybody. Yeah. And, but when I finally was able to forgive like you did, it was such a wonderful cleansing kind of thing. And now I can look to those incidents that happened and be grateful for them because I wouldn't be who I am today without them. Amen. Amen. And the thing about forgiveness is, and I, sh I share this with clients because it was my own experience, experience. Forgiveness is part of what I talked about uh, during the service last week. It's part of that divine grace. It's not something mm. you can just decide to make it happen. And the gift of that is we need to go through the process. We need to feel the anger. We need to feel the emotions around it. I mean, part of my healing process was two eight-page, single-space, typewritten letters that I wrote confronting my dad about the early childhood abuse. And then when he responded to my letter, he wrote his own eight-page letter back, <laughs> um, basically justifying all the stuff and you, but a lot of excuses and a lot of stuff. And I, it was interesting to me because the inner child in me, I think, was, which was the one who wrote that first letter, somehow thought that if I could explain it clearly enough that he would come back and go, oh my God, Karstenner, that was his nickname for me, Karstenner. Oh my God, Karstenner, you're so right. What could I have been thinking? I'm so sorry. As if that would have made it all better, <laughs> because mm -hmm. it wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He showed up as the man who did those things. Um, and so I was able, as the adult, to take his letter and really respond as the adult. So it really was, it was a process of separation mm -hmm. from the role of victim and victimizer into two adults who are doing their best to play with this crazy world we've been been thrown into. And of course, my through the stuff I went through with my parents, my belief is that our parents give us everything they have, all the quote good and all the bad, because that's what they got from their parents. And none of it's good or bad. It's just stuff that's out there so we can navigate through it and move forward, find more mm -hmm. of a sense of peace, more of a sense mm -hmm. of harmony within, more of that energy of compassion and connection with life rather than the need to feel defensive and always feel like we're having to, to navigate this thing that's coming at us. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you for sharing that. Now, I um, before we get into all of your awesomeness, one more question I have for you. I know that you have a partner and some animals, a lot of animals in your apartment. So tell us a little bit about your personal life there. And then we're going to get into New York after that. Okay. Well, I, I moved to San Francisco. Gosh, it's going on 14 years now. And I had, I had, uh, after growing up in Southern California, I moved to New York city around my, my mid twenties to be an actor, to be a performer, to, you know, follow my dream. And I was there for 25 years. And then my mom got sick. And it was clear as the disease started to to, you know, take control that somebody needed to be out there to take care of her. And even though my mom and I had had a real fairly rocky relationship as well, I knew because of my spiritual journey that someone needed to be out there with her, one of the kids. And I really was the only one with the tools who was able to deal with my mom because she could be very critical and very difficult. So I chose to do that. And I knew at the time that it was going to be a real a real gift. And, and it was, it was a nine month period where we worked to get, you know, where, where we really got to know each other for the first time, separate from the mother son roles. And as two souls on this journey in the planet, I can't tell you how many times we both said, Oh my God, I can't, I can't believe how alike we are hmm. because we thought we were so different. But of course that's the truth of our parents. They, they mm -hmm. give us that stuff. But then after she passed, I spent a few years in Southern California. My 
partner of eight years and, and I broke up soon after my mom passed, which I find working with clients, that often happens after a parent passes. People reevaluate their relationships and, and things <clears throat> change. As my brother also left his wife of many years and remarried after my mom wow. died. But, uh, but yeah, uh, then uh, after that, uh, someone and I, I just all of a sudden after a, after about, about a couple of years out in Southern California in my old stomping grounds, really kind of sowing some wild oats because I'd broken up with my partner and the internet was open. It's like, okay, what's going on out there? <laughs> uh, I suddenly mm -hmm. decided I'm done here. I'm not sure where I want to go, but my ex was still living in the apartment we had in, in New York. So I thought, let me go back there and kind of reevaluate. I can save money because that was a real cheap apartment. We'd be sharing rent. But then three people in the same week said, hey, have you checked out San Francisco? And I'd never been, believe it or not, mm -hmm. even living in California for all that time. I never made it up up north. And so I connected with some friends. I came up and stayed with them. I listed myself on one of the gay chat sites and said, you know, I'm coming to, to San Francisco. Who wants to show me around? And I got a couple of hits, no one that really interested in me. But then I got one that said, I'll show you. And I looked at the picture and it was Toro, my apartment my partner who I live in the apartment now with. And I thought, Oh yeah, you can show me. And six weeks later we were in this apartment. So that's wow. how fast spirit said, okay, mom's done. You finished that karma. Now here's a new karmic chapter to move through. So I have to say, <laughs> I, I called Toro my Buddha because he's another a personality. He's, he's Mongolian and he's, he actually is, is descended from uh, Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. That they did this special on one of the PBS stations where they came and they took people's DNA because they was it was the, the, the birth of man or, or searching for Adam. Some of you may remember that mm -hmm. that special that they did. Well, anyway, Toro was one of those who came up positive as a DNA match for Genghis Khan. Wow. So he's got that strong energy. And so bumping up against that strong energy, but knowing because I, you know, through my own journey, I trust my heart. And even though a lot of the things in my head said, are you sure I want to get together with this guy? He's, you know, 18 years younger and, you know, all this stuff. But my heart was like, no, this is what's here. And he clearly has similar feelings for you. Let's see what happens. And I have to say, not a day goes by that I don't feel the gratitude and the love and the pre appreciation that we found each other and that I was able to, even at the time, to say, oh, I've got to get my F out of this relationship <laughs> because we moved into this apartment. It all happened so easily. And I, you know, I would ask Spear, okay, how much trouble is it going to be to try to separate? And how, compare that to trying to work things out using the own my own tools that I share with my clients in this relationship. And it was, you know, it's been such a healing and really loving process. So that's it. And he loves animals as I do. And so uh, we've got guinea pigs. We've got a, a bunch of canaries and birds. Uh, I have, of course, my Bengal cat, who's the, like the love of my life, practically. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, and, and and I love San Francisco. It's, you know, this has really been a sanctuary for me these last 14 years. And also to be able to get reconnected with Unity through being on the board with you at Unity SF and then being the spiritual leader up at Unity of Ukiah for seven years. And now the fact mm -hmm. that you and I have been able to come together at Unity of Richmond East Bay, it's just, there's so many things in my life that when I step back, I can just see that divine spirit has always been there going, what about this? What does mm -hmm. this look like? And the more I can let go and just trust, I realize that it's all there. And when I push too hard, I get in my way. I don't see it. So it really is being able to trust the trust the divine support of the universe, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what we teach. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes, sometimes we forget too. we do spiritual bypass, you know, oh, and, totally. um, but we have to remember it also. There are times Peter can actually tell you, and I hope he doesn't right now, but um, <laughs> Peter can tell you, you know, I get really irritated with all the dogs sometimes and I love them all as well. And uh, there are times I'm trying to get work done and you get irritated and I have to go back and take a deep breath and go upstairs in my room and go, okay, let me, and one time Peter said, Brock, you're not practicing what you preach. 
And so I went, did he really just say that to me? <laughs> so at any rate, but we have to be reminded also, and we have to do the practice and the work. And that's what keeps us actively into the teachings. Well, we, well, one of the one of the things that's been such a gift for me, it's, it's a, a book and a 10 week process called The Presence Process. And it teaches you to thank the messenger and get the message whenever you're triggered. Mm -hmm. And it really helped me to realize that those triggers that come up, the dogs, especially our animals, you know, Max, Bengal cats are very vocal. And I have learned, it's taken me almost five years, because I've had Max for almost five years, that Max can key into my anxiety. And he'll start meowing. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet your dogs do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I've learned, mm -hmm. and I don't do this all the time. So I'm like, going, I'll shut up, Max, and I'll take him and put him in the other room. But mostly, if I stop and pet him and go, what's going on with you now? That's what I need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's exactly. what I need. And then he calms mm -hmm. down, and then I can focus on, on what I want to do. But that's, that, mm -hmm. that's one of the gifts of being on this journey and having there's so many tools out there that, that can help us remember that there's always a different way to approach life and that we do get programmed those early programming by our in the most cases and i don't really like the word dysfunctional family if we're still here talking about it then they're semi-functional they've gotten mm -hmm. us here so they're not mm -hmm. dysfunctional but mm -hmm. they do give us the karmic fuel to then move through life if we're willing to open up to life itself and let it teach us let it own mm -hmm. us, let us, and you know, certainly unity and so many of the wonderful teachings out there have so many tools that are so helpful. And I can forget to use them as well sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about unity too before we end up today, but we're about to go to break in about um, four minutes, Karsten, and we'll take a, about a three minute break. But before we do, give us, uh, let's take this time before the break. You used to live in New York. I know you're on Broadway and a performer. Give us some insight into your life there. Oh, my goodness. Well, I was there for 25 years, so it was quite a life. Wow. The thing about New York, and I tell people this, is visiting New York is not at all like living there. And it takes about a year to assimilate so you can really feel like, oh, this is mine. And when you've lived there for long enough and New York becomes your backyard, it just is a magical place. The people the energy, the possibilities. I mean, although I went there to be a performer and I did a lot of that, I also spent a lot of time doing temp work. I was a legal secretary, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently. But I look back at that and that was also wonderful. I mean, it, and a lot of it depends. Any job, I think, mainly depends on who you're working with. Mm -hmm. And my job at like EMI Records, when I worked in the music department, I loved the people that worked there. I still think of them as part of my soul family. Um, but yeah, New, New York is, is a magical place. And a lot of what I did when I got to New York was put my own stuff together because I was not a good auditioner. I would get too nervous and too frustrated. I would, you know, practice my monologue forever. It would be perfect. And then I'd go in and I'd go, uh, bo, bo, bo. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, I think my, my, I think my best talent is dancing. And one of the things that got me to say uh, i'm going to own the fact that i want to be a performer and i want to do this is for my high school graduation my good friend michael invited me up to las vegas to see diana ross who invited me up on stage to dance with her during a uh, love hangover and she gave me her scarf at the end of the show because she was so impressed i did the bump with her and i was doing <laughs> the robot she was like whoa this white boy can dance <laughs> do you still have that scarf no no my i gave it to my sister when she moved from we were, you know, from she was the first one to come back to New York because she got in, she got into the neighborhood playhouse school. Well, I gave it to her to ultimately give back to me, but just for her journey. Well, she lost it. So Aww. that's another thing that I was sitting there after that big thing at the Denver Fringe Festival that all the stuff in the past came up and I was able to feel all those old resentments and stuff. So, mm. she, you know, she still may be able to be able to find it somewhere. But, you know, I, I've, I've let go of that. Uh, Good for you. Uh, and thank you for sharing that also. Um, I was going to say, if you still had that scarf, I'd like to touch it. <laughs> to see no, it. I would like you to know? touch it again, too. Yeah, it had a <laughs> lipstick on it and everything. It was, yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh. And, and I have pictures of her in the outfit that she wore for that, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Peter, I think it's time for us to take a break, um, if you'll take this out. And we'll be back 
at New Thought Media Network. Don't y'all go anywhere. We still have a lot more to discuss with Karsten Spencer, and we'll be back in just a few minutes on New Thought Media Network. <laughs> Well, looks like we're back, everyone, at New Thought Media Network, Spiritual Toolkit, and my guest, Karsten Spencer. Thank you for joining us and staying with us. Hi, Karsten. Welcome back. Thanks, Brock. So we got, we're in the second half of the show. And so what I'd like to ask you next is, would you tell us a little bit about your journey to New Thought Teachings and how that started and how you ended up with Unity? Well, I would say it started, I, at my first two and a half years in school, my parents sent us to a Catholic school because somehow they heard that the, the, the public schools weren't very good. So they sent us to, to them. And halfway through my second grade year, I just was, was not willing to go anymore. The, the, the nun that was teaching my class sort of was picked me out. I don't know if it was because I, I was one of the non-Catholics or whatever, but I was just would be sick every day. And so I finally got out of that. And so for a long time, because of that early kind of wounding Catholic experience, I was an atheist, like all through my growing up years. And then when I moved to first moved to New York, someone well, even before that, someone had given me given me a book on yoga. And as I began doing some of the practices, particularly the meditation and stuff, I began to open to, oh, there is something more out there than just this tuned into that energy. And also I would also get that message through, through nature. And then when I moved to uh, New York, someone told me about unity and I used to every Sunday go and hear Eric Butterworth uh, speak. And Paul Tanagli was also the associate minister then too. So if Eric wasn't speaking, Paul was there and me and Paul made a, a very great connection. We were kind of kindred spirits. And so I got very involved with, with unity, uh, in in new york 
Uh, and that kind of led to a lot of other things. I found the Seth material around that same time. Have you heard of the Seth material? Jane Roberts back in the 60s tuned into this entity, which she called Seth, who she would kind of go into a trance or just sort of zone out. And first, it first came through writing, and then she was able to just dictate it to her husband. But the first mm -hmm. book that came out was called Seth Speaks, and then the second one was called The Nature of Personal Reality. And th I think that's a book, if anyone's interested, to go ahead and get, because it really speaks to what Unity talks about and what... Uh, what, what so many of, of these new thought teachers talk about. Uh, so that was a big, big part of my journey. And then through that, I got connected with uh, uh, past life regressions through the Light Institute. Uh, I went there a, a couple of times into what I would call extensive past life uh recall because it's not like someone else is telling you about your past life you lie on a table and they take you into a call it kind of a a light meditative state but they connect you with your higher power and the higher power and i think that was one of the most powerful gifts of that process is i came out of it with a deeper more intimate connection with that inner guidance although i will say that when i get triggered or things stressed out i can totally forget that but that was that was one of the gifts. And then uh, after that, I got connected with Siddha Yoga, which is some of the ancient Indian guru traditions. So I did a lot of chanting, a lot of a lot of work through them. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I've because of my early Catholic stuff, because I was gay, which at that point in, in life, you realize, you know, when you decide to own that part of yourself, that it makes you kind of separate from the, the established world. So the gift of that is I really felt free to explore all sorts of different things. I didn't feel I had to fit into some box. I was just more of a free spirit, which allowed me to really explore a lot of different religions and a lot of new thought stuff, a lot of energy work. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, well, that's my, go ahead. I was gonna say, since you're speaking about energy, tell us about your energy alignment and the three breaths. How does all of that work? Well, the miracle in three breaths is something I came up with uh, really right after I moved to uh, San Francisco <clears throat> and decided to really begin because I was teaching yoga before that and I was doing doing what what I call uh, yoga energy massage. So I was, I was working one on one with, with clients doing yoga and also doing hands on energy work. And then when I moved to New York, uh, I and clients were asking me because, you know, uh, when I moved to New York and I was teaching yoga after I after I lived there you, you know the opportunity to teach yoga I was taking a class and I had no intention of actually teaching but the teacher asked me to stay after class one day and I thought oh my god am I in trouble because he was one of those yoga <laughs> teachers who could be very <laughs> strict and he said you know the YMCA wants to add more yoga classes and I don't want to teach anymore my schedule is full so I told them I would find a teacher and I think you might make a good teacher. Have you had any experience? And I said, no, I've never taught yoga, but I did teach dance in the past and whatever. He said, good. Then, you know, he, he kind of mentored me and I and I began to to uh, teach yoga. And through that, it led ultimately uh, once I moved up to San Francisco to more of my spiritual work and the miracle in three three breasts because that's I started working again one on one with clients. People would you know they'd come. I'd work with them. I do the energy work. I do sound healing with my voice as well, which helps to balance chakras. Um, and I also work with work with crystals. And when clients would come, they say, "Oh my God! Every time I come, I you know I come in so stressed out and I feel so calm and relaxed." But then the minute I go out in the world, I, you know, I lose it. You know, do you have any techniques that will help? So I remembered when I was teaching in New York, it was a Friday night, uh, six o'clock class in New York City. So people would come in very stressed out. So that's when I first started using the miracle in three breaths. And I called it my, my uh, yoga tranquilizer. And it basically, I can do it with people right now. It's very simple. And there's also a video on my website. But you start just by getting comfortable, recognizing where you are, tuning into gravity. And the first breath is you draw in that connection with Mother Earth. So everybody do that. And then as you exhale, you just notice how that felt. Whatever is present as the breath flows out, you notice how that felt. And then as you're about to breathe again, you open up the crown chakra, drawing in that divine spirit. 
-hmm. And as you exhale, you just feel that divine spirit saturating every cell and every system of your body. And then as you take your final third breath, you activate the heart center, that kingdom of heaven within. Mm -hmm. And then as you exhale, you simply hum, allowing the vibration to activate all this in your system. And then you just notice. And no matter how stressed out you were, if you do that as best you can, you don't have to do it perfectly, you will notice things start to shift. Sometimes they can start to shift a lot. And you always want to give yourself space just to notice what's there afterwards. And if you've got the time and you're feeling really stressed out, do it again. Those three breaths, notice how you feel. You know, sometimes we forget to take a breath. And just doing that right now with you guiding us, when we took those three breaths, I can honestly say now, I feel like I just sort of settled in a little bit. And yeah. my, my, my breathing became softer. And uh, I almost feel like I just had a nap or something. And, you, <laughs> and that was like in two seconds. But I wanted to ask you a question about that. Um, the, the sound healing and the Tibetan warrior, things of that nature. Um, I know that sometimes at night I'll, I'll go onto YouTube and I'll look for different sounds to just sort of help. Sometimes it's rain, you know, sometimes it's a meditation thing or frequency, but um, I've, I've found those Tibetan bowl uh, sounds. And so I've been watching those late at night. So Tell me a little bit about how that energy works because I'm a lay person with that. And so I know that when I hear those bowls being, you know, uh, strummed or whatever you say, um, it does something to you. It does something to me. And so at Unity Village last year at the Anton Conference, they had someone do that and they had multiple people. It was phenomenal what happened to that room. So how does that work? Well, uh, I'm sure you notice, and maybe the, the, the people who are, who are on with us today are listening to this later, if you actually did the hum at the end of the three breaths, that mm -hmm. hum is what brings it all together. We have seven main chakras, but the throat chakra is the only chakra that actually can create a physical vibration, which mm -hmm. is sound. So our throat chakra is really powerful. If you If you... If you go to a lot of seminars or you watch speakers or even watch things on TV or, or, you know, we're all around people, you will notice that the quality, the tone, the cadence of just a speaking voice has a lot of energy in it, separate from what the person is actually saying. And so vibration is very powerful. The reason like the Tibetan bowls or the sound healing that I do with my voice uh, has such a power is because it's a clear, sustained tone which allows the chakra system to come into harmony sometimes with these with these live things that are the, or the zoom that we're doing here when i do a sustained tone it will kind of fade out but i'm going to do one and even if it fades out i want people to just because the vibration even if you're not hearing it audibly it moves out so i want people to tune into their heart chakra and i'm just going to sing a gentle sustained tone and just let yourself breathe into it And as you feel ready, come back. But that's the power of sound. You know, this physical universe that we live in, there's really nothing solid here. The quantum scientists have told us that. It is a combination of energetic patterns. And from my point of view, and I'm not a scientist, but I'm, and this is the other thing. And when you said, I'm a lay person, I don't really know about this. All the clients that I work with, the message I want to give to them is you have all the information within you. Yes, there's hordes of wonderful information out there and i never want to stifle people from looking for information but very when metatron that that, that divine archangel showed up for me 
I the like the, the the week after he showed up very powerfully during a session, I was opening someone's heart chakra, and the the window in my living room burst open. Not physically, but I had my eyes closed, but I saw it with my inner vision and this energetic pattern. It was kind of this beautiful orange sacred geometry moved in filled the room i actually had to back up as i was continuing to do the tone it was up against the back of the wall and the voice i heard in my head as that window opened and that energy came in it was metatron mm. <laughs> after, after the tone finally and it was this tone that seemed to last forever my client and i just started laughing and she was like what was that and i said it was metatron i don't know but all during that week Every time I went to look up Metatron on, on the computer, get more information, I would hear th that voice. And I want to call it his voice, but it, you know, the, 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 they're, 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 they don't have one sex. But he would say, why are you looking online? I'm right here. <laughs> Anything you want to ask, ask me and start to trust that inner guidance. So mm. that's the other thing. If people are interested in sounding and vibration, play with it on your own. I invite my clients all the time to simply hum into their heart center. Feel that connection between throat and heart as you just do a simple hum, letting it bring you into a meditation. A lot of people will do an OM coming into mm -hmm. meditation. Same thing when we do the OM, just think of the vowel. And OM is one of the warrior seed syllables, which I'm I'm teaching now. And I actually want to give an, a wonderful offer to anyone who's listening today. If you want to join us on this journey, there's four more weeks and I can send out the, uh, the recording of last week's session. But these are ancient uh, from the, the Bon Tibetan Buddhist tradition. These are ancient symbols that balance and align the chakras and open up a channel to clear what the Tibetan Buddhists call the obscurations that we take on because of the karmic mm -hmm. stuff. So it really is able to clear the, the chakras and thus allow the Shakti or the life force to flow through more fully with the intention of inviting in that divine guidance from mm -hmm. above. So, the, you know, and the main thing about the, the sounds, the tones, they bring all parts into the moment. That's why we love music mm -hmm. so much, right? That's why mm -hmm. music speaks to us and it's a spiritual, uh, a spiritual thing, a spiritual practice, because it brings us into the heart. It's speaking to us on many levels. Mm -hmm. I know that when you were doing that sound, I actually felt a vibration in my arms. You know, I mean, it's like it was coming from you through this but the sound i'm going to pay more attention to the sound as i go forward and thank you for sharing that with us so that i can learn that as well um i know that when i saw there were probably like 10 bowls and 10 people doing that sound all in unison last year at the conference it was an amazing experience yes it's unbelievable so at any rate we've got y'all we've got about um, 10 minutes left on the show. It's gone by really fast, actually. I know, it sure has. I know. So, Karsten, would you, um, are you prepared to give us a reading today? Well, you with, know, uh, sure, what I'd like to do since I talked about the, uh, uh, and people can go to my website, karstenspencer.com, but since I talked about the warrior seed syllables, which we started last week, I'd just like to read a little bit about that and and, you know, the, the gift of this is maybe the third or fourth time I've taught the the warrior seed syllables, but the uh, I think one of my gifts, uh, partly because of the crazy childhood where I kind of had to continually be reevaluating where am I living, what's going on here, who's my friend and who's my enemy, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. is it allows me to trust that everything is always evolving. Mm -hmm. And so this this mm -hmm. time teaching the warrior seed syllables, I'm really excited because so much of the stuff that because I, I went into like what I, what, I, what I would call a deep uh, hibernation or, or cocoon process during the pandemic because I was doing a lot of inner spiritual practices. I really took advantage of the fact that we were all sequestered. Um, and now I did a lot of toning, a lot of work with my crystals, a lot of work with the chakras, a lot of work with calling in my guides to kind of help help rehone this uh not only the physical apparatus of our of our bodies but the energetic apparatus and now that i'm going back into the the warrior seed syllables because they have this ancient energy from the tibetan buddhists it they just feel more powerful than ever and i've got about 17 people already signed up but there's room for more if anyone's interested but let me just read this to just sort of share a little bit about this process. One of the world's oldest unbroken spiritual traditions is the Bon Buddhist tradition of T Tibet. This wisdom path has survived for over 10,000 years. 
During this five-week course, we will experience the power of Tibetan sound healing and learn to use the ancient sacred sounds of the Bon practice to activate the healing poten potential of our natural mind. And what I want to say is, according to the Tibetan Buddhist, the mind is not the brain. Our mind exists in the heart and mm. takes, you know, takes advantage of the brain, the intellect, the emotions. It brings all parts of us together. The Bon healing tradition invokes the five warrior syllables, seed sounds that bring us to the essential nature of mind and release the boundless creativity and positive qualities that are fundamental to it. Through the medicine of sound, we learn to clear obstacles in body, energy, and emotion, as well as the subtle sacred dimension of being. And that's really, I will say, what we glimpsed or what we can glimpse just through that simple uh, miracle in three breaths, those three breaths and the humming and the relaxation that came in. Brock, what you talked about, about feeling mm -hmm. like you just woke up from the, from the nap. That's mm -hmm. that subtle, sacred uh, aspect of being or dimension of being. It's what the, the Christ talked about, the kingdom of heaven within. It's that energy that's always with us when we're willing to stop and look within. Mm -hmm. This course is designed to give you the tools to access your unique wisdom and compassion by using the vibration of sacred sound to cultivate the healing, har healing, harmonizing power within your subtle channels, which is the chakras. We activate the chakras. The five weeks will also include specific techniques and practices I've developed using these powerful syllables with clients and on my own to clear karmic patterns and mental and emotional clutter and activate creativity, inspiration, and an intimate connection to your higher guidance. So that's the other thing I want to share. And whether or not you want to, you decide to do the warrior seed syllables, and there, there's lots of stuff on, on YouTube. Actually, the, the main teacher who, who, who my teaching evolved out of has five different uh, videos on YouTube. So you can check that out. Put in Tibetan sound healing, and his videos will come up so you can check it out. But... Ask your inner guidance. Do, you know, if, if anyone is feeling the need to connect more fully with that inner connection, nature is a wonderful way, but breath and gravity and a simple hum and then staying open. Ask and ye shall receive is a really wonderful thing. And you want to start by asking for simple things. Like if you're feeling confused or a lot going on, stop, take a few breaths and ask for clarity. Hmm. And then after you ask, take a breath, because very often spirit is present and you will get clarity right away. If it doesn't come, then that's the time to say, OK, what is present? Because if you ask for clarity and you're still feeling the anxiety, trust that spirit is giving you exactly what you need. And perhaps you need to just sit with the anxiety and see what that has to tell you. Most of the uncomfortable emotions push us into the fight, flight, fixing. Mm -hmm. But what the presence process teaches us, what the warrior seats syllables coach us to do is be with the discomfort, invite it to do what it's supposed to do when we can be with it and stop trying to fix, which is putting the karma back out there. Because if you throw it out there, it's going to come back. That's why it was so powerful that I didn't react to my sister when that whole thing happened. I mm -hmm. took care of myself. Mm -hmm. When you don't do it, you allow it to come within you. The answer always comes, but sometimes in divine timing. So you can ask for something in prayer. And what the ego does is if it doesn't come right away, it's like, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. And you <laughs> move forward. <laughs> it's but, true. That's, but that's what faith is about. I'm going to put it out there. If it doesn't come right away, that's okay. But let me be present with what's here because maybe that clarity is by moving through what's present rather than trying mm -hmm. to get rid of it. I truly believe that if we can acknowledge the presence when we're in that state of confusion or irritability or whatever, but if we can be present in that moment, because that's really what we have, we don't have that next moment. We don't have the one before it. So when we can be present, I had uh, Missy Higginbotham on the show uh, last month and she is a big proponent of presence of uh, really, truly studying to be present with people and with yourself. So thank you for that, um, Karsten. Was there anything else about that you wanted to say? 
Um, there was, but I kind of blanked out for a minute. Let me see if, it'll, <laughs> if it will pop back. There's Turo. Hi, honey. I'm on, I'm on a call right now. Say hi. <laughs> hi, Turo. Hello. So uh, we've got about five, well, four minutes left, actually. Um, what would be some last thoughts that you would like to leave with people here today? Well, I, I think before we leave the warrior seed syllables, I want to give a special gift to who's ever interested and is is thinking of, of wanting to work with me in the future. You can go to my website and use the at, at checkout, push on the warrior seed syllables. It'll give you more information to see if it's something you really want to do at checkout. You can put in the, the coupon code SEED50, C -E or S-E-E-D, the number 50, and it will give you a 50% a discount. And the other thing I will offer anyone who signs up for the course and wants to join us for the final four courses, and you'll, you'll get a, a recording of the first one, so you'll get all five. Uh, I want to offer a 60-minute one-on-one session. If you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can come and we'll do it in person. If you're not, we can do it online. And I will say the sound healing and the work that I do works very powerfully online. You don't have to do it in person. And if anyone has questions about that or whatever, you can contact me through my website or through Karsten Spencer at hotmail.com. Hmm. Carson, that is really, really kind of you to do that um, for our uh, audience. So audience, please take up on that. Take that up and uh, take him up on that. And and let's go together. I'll be glad to go as well. So we'd love to take Wonderful. that course too, Carson. Wonderful. Thank you. That would help us. Um, wow. We've come to the end of our show, everyone. And Carson, I'm so grateful for your participation and sharing such interesting thoughtful and helpful information as well. I love you so much. I'm so glad that we're working together again and that you joined our show today. Thank you. Me, me too. And, and Brock, uh, I, I love you too. And th just mm -hmm. thank you so much for doing this for, you know, for, for all that you do, but also for, for doing this and getting it out there. And I want to invite everyone to join us on Sundays at yes. unity of Richmond East Bay. If you're in the, in the, uh, in the new, uh, San Francisco Bay area. You can join us in person, but we also uh, stream on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can get that information uh, online as well. Unity of and, Richmond East Bay. And y'all, I can tell you, it is a joyful experience it being is at that joy. church. Yeah. We yeah. have fun, we interact, and we have presence and power and mightiness. Well, and, 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 and we're starting a choir. We're, we're going to be starting we a are. choir soon. We're also going to be doing the Unity of Richmond East Bay Players because I'm an actor and a playwright and I've written, found a play that I wrote, uh, during, wrote years ago during the pandemic. So I put a cast together. We've got a nice stage there. So mm -hmm. come and join us. Our mission with Unity of East Bay uh, is to activate people's creativity really help people move into their power and their truth mm -hmm. it's true thank you karsten and y'all don't forget to check out his website at karstenspencer.com and i want to thank all the viewers that showed up today thank you so very much and the, the viewers that are going to see this later on when they decide to take a look at it thank you for being here and joining us and join us next week when we meet with the founder of New Thought Media Network, who is Reverend Dr. Robert Brzezinski. And y'all, I'm excited to talk to him. He's an amazing person. He's got a, a wealth of information that is way beyond my comprehension. And so we'll be able to talk with him and find out more about this network, his ministry. Uh, his wife is also in ministry with him. And also check out all the other great shows, y'all. There's so many. Uh, there's meditation shows. There's actually live stream uh, Sunday uh, sermon type shows, um, practitioner shows, all kinds of shows on New Thought Media Network that can uplift and help you. So check those out at ntmedia.org. And y'all, I guess I'm going to say good night, everyone. See you next week and blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Karsten. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brock, for everything. And thank you, Peter, for being our tech person. Thank you, Peter.